morning, church. I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Matthew, chapter 10. And it's an interesting passage of uh, teaching that Jesus gives to his disciples. In fact, it's really their call to service, their call to go out into the field and to do as he has been doing. Matthew, chapter 10. I'll read it to you from the New King James Version, and we'll pick it up here with verse 5. Matthew 10 from verse 5. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us opportunity to know you and to love you. As we read this passage, as we meditate upon your word, please, Lord, just take us in your hands, and may we have an experience that will touch our hearts and our minds, that will cause our hands and our feet to become of service to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 10 from verse 5, it says, These twelve, and the passage before this has just named them one by one, but these twelve disciples Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. Okay, pause there for just a moment so we can get our heads around what's being said here. We're asking ourselves, to whom is Jesus sending these disciples of his? Well, the two fields outside of Jerusalem, outside of Judea, outside of the Jewish Israelite people have just been excluded. The Gentiles, which is anything that's not of Jewish nationality, and the Samaritans who were somewhere in between and were hated more by the Jews, perhaps, than even the Gentiles were. Because there's only one thing worse than something that's completely opposite to you, and that's something that is a half-breed. And the Samaritans, you could say, were a little bit of a half-breed. They had a syncretist religion, they were part Jewish, they were very idolatrous, and they were the result of what happened uh, many hundreds of years before this, when the northern kingdoms of Israel, with their capital city of Samaria, fell at the hands of the Assyrians. And they were scattered throughout the land, they were dispersed, hence the word diaspora, which is the, the scattering of the Jewish people, and then they intermarried with the people around them. And along with the intermarriage came not only a biological blending of nationalities, but the adoption of these pagan gods which were blended with the Israelite god, which of course was the very reason why they had been uh, permitted by God to be judged in the first place. So my point is that the field that Jesus is sending his disciples to is not the foreign mission field. It's not the Gentiles and it's not the Samaritans. He says in verse 6, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now at this point in the biblical record, if you understand the prophecies of the book of Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 7, which contains what we call the 70-week prophecy, you will know that that is a prophecy that was to span 490 years, which is stated in verse 24 to have been cut off, decreed, set aside for the Jewish people and for the city of Jerusalem. The angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and says, this prophecy is for your people and your holy city. Chronologically, this is right in the last week of those 70 weeks, and that's a symbolic 70 weeks, a literal 490 years. It's the last seven years of that prophecy which is specifically for the Jewish people and the city of Jerusalem. So my point is that the Israelite people are still recognized by God as his people. The Israelite people are still what we would call the church. Does that make sense? Yes, they were national. Yes, they were a national identity, a people, a country, but they were regarded spiritually by God as his church, his instruments to the world, the one through whom he was going to bring the plan of salvation. Jesus at the well, and I think it's John chapter 4, speaking to the woman there says, salvation is of the Jews. That is, through the Jewish people, that 70-week prophecy had foretold that God would bring about the plan of salvation. And here we are at the conclusion of that prophecy. Jesus is amongst them. He has been born of a Jewish family, and he is bringing the gift of salvation. He has called his disciples all Jewish men, right? Twelve of them. One disciple for every tribe in Israel. And he says, now I want you to go. I want you to take this message. Before you go into the foreign mission field, I want you to take this message to its hometown. 
because there are lost sheep in the church. There are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Do not assume for a moment that just because they are called Israel, just because they are members of the present day church perhaps, that it automatically necessarily means that they are safe and secure in terms of their salvation. So Jesus says, I want you to go to my own. I want you to go to the people of God. I want you to go to the people whom you could say should know. I want you to start there. And here's what I want you to do. As you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out the demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics nor sandals nor staffs for a worker is worthy of his food. Now whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you, nor your words, when you depart from that house or that city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And here it comes. Are you ready for this? Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you where? In the synagogues. Was Jesus talking about Roman opposition? Was Jesus talking about Gentile or Samaritan opposition? What opposition were the disciples going to face? From whence was the opposition going to come? From within the church from within the people who are called by the name of God. He sends them to bring the message of a Messiah, a Savior from their sins. He sends them to the very people who should have been prepared and who should have embraced this message already, who should have been at His service, ready to take this message to the Gentile and Samaritan world. But they're not ready. And so Jesus says, the first field of labor that I have for you, 12 disciples, the apostles, is go to the lost, lost sheep of the house of Israel. I want you to preach, I want you to teach, I want you to demonstrate in all practical sense the power of the gospel amongst them. And then don't be surprised when they turn their backs on the message. Don't be surprised when you preach a message of truth and of salvation and the people respond by rejecting you. Don't be surprised that the very people who you would think would receive it would be the people who would reject it. What on earth does that have to do with the price of eggs today? The same is still true of the church of God today. A people who should know, a people who are privileged with light and with understanding, with prophetic revelation, with biblical understanding, a people with a history and with an experience in walking with God ought to know and be the instruments of God to the fallen and to the lost. And yet that very church sometimes needs to be taught and educated. And yet that very church sometimes will reject and rise up in opposition against messages brought by God's people. Why am I sharing this with you this morning? I'm trying to illustrate to you actually something quite different but related to what I've said already. I want you to notice that Jesus still called this church His. He says, you're going to find opposition there, but they are still the lost sheep in the house of Israel. Israel, prince with God. That's what the name means. Israel, Jacob the supplanter, the deceiver, who was renamed Israel, after which the whole nation was named. Prince with God. They are still his people. He still calls them his people. You can have a look at the Gospel of John, chapter 10 and verse 31. You can have a look at the Gospel of John chapter 8 and verse 59. Two instances where Jesus goes to the synagogue. He meets with his people. And in response to what he shares with them, they pick up stones to stone him. Their Messiah. The, exist, the, the reason they have their existence is this Jesus and they pick up stones to stone him. And yet you know what the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 says? As was his custom. 
That means Jesus was not sporadic. As his custom was, that, that, that means that Jesus was not haphazard. As his custom was. That means that Jesus was not once in a while, in a blue moon, if he felt like it, if the tides were right, if the stars were aligned in the right order, if people were nice to him, he came to church. No, as his custom was. On the Sabbath day, Jesus went to the synagogue, the very place where they picked up stones to stone him. And he was there the next day, or the next Sabbath rather. They picked up stones to stone him again. He was there next Sabbath, as his custom was. They were his people. They were rebellious. They were obstinate. They were imperfect. They were in a sad place spiritually, but Jesus still aligned himself with his church. Jesus still stuck by the unworthy. You could argue that they were more unworthy than the Gentiles, because the Gentiles at least didn't know anything. These people ought to have known. Jesus stuck by his people. How easy we find it today to jump ship when the guy next to us is rude. When the church doesn't seem to stand for what we think is truth. How quick we are to criticize, to break down the body of Christ, whom Christ himself identifies with through the thick and through the thin, through the highs and through the lows. And I ask you, are you and I in a position to be any less kind to the church than what Christ is to that church? How easy it is for us to take personal offense. Because guess what? The guy sitting next to you, the gal sitting next to you in church today has issues just like you. Because this church and the church across the world is made up. The problem with the church, the problem with the church today is it's made up of people like me. People like you. And yet Jesus loves his church to the point of dying for it. Have you given your life for your church? Have you given your life for the brethren? John chapter 13. Jesus sitting around that table with his disciples says, a new commandment, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just a few chapters after that, a page or two after that, he says, no greater love has a man than that he lay down his life for his friends. And I'm going to lay down my life for you. No greater commandment that you love like I have loved. This morning I challenge you. As we celebrate communion, as we break that bread, as we drink that grape juice, a symbol of the love of God poured out in sacrifice for a church that rejected him. You know, it was this very church that nailed him to the cross, right? You know, it was this church, this Israelite nation, which employed the power of the Roman state to accomplish their goals of getting rid of their Messiah. And yet Jesus loved them and gave them three and a half years of mercy after that, after the cross. He didn't even abandon or jump ship after they nailed him to the cross. When you feel crucified by the brethren, when you feel betrayed by the brethren, when you feel cheated by the brethren, all I want you to know is that you're walking in the feet of Jesus. And when you're tempted to overreact when you're tempted to break ties I want you to ask yourself this am I acting in the spirit of Jesus or am I aligning myself with the accuser of the brethren who is quick to point fingers quick to break down or am I coming alongside to minister like Jesus am I praying God forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing extend your grace and your mercy to these Fallen people who, yes, you could say should know better, but God, have mercy upon them. And by the way, God, have mercy upon me. Today we celebrate what God has done for us. We celebrate His love. And I ask you, do we love like Christ loves? Do we love the unlovable like Christ loves the unlovable? Do we love those who look just like us when we look in the mirror? Or are we quick to quit on them? Are we quick to jump ship 
when we think it's not up to par, up to standard, when people aren't treating me right the way I think they ought to. I'll be willing to bet that not one of you have come to church on a Sabbath morning and had your life at threat. Oh, someone might not have greeted you at the door.